since the 1960s, food is oil. In 1944, the average American farm produced 2,300 calories of food energy for every calorie of fossil fuel energy went into the field. In 1974, historically, that ratio became one to one. In our own time, thanks to nitrogen fertilizers, oil-based pesticides, refrigeration and four-figure food miles, it's 2,000 to one reverse. So you'd think, wouldn't you? The lead item on every new show every night would be, how are we gonna feed ourselves now that the oil is running out? There's a very timely book out at the minute called Who Will Feed China? Wake Up Call for a Small Planet. Although personally, I think they're asking the wrong question. The question should, of course, be, when will feed China? <laughs> Who's going to feed South America? Who's going to feed Europe? Big questions no one's asking. There's only one place I know on this planet doing any research into this. The Ecology Institute in Willits, California. And their statistical modelling starts on the assumption that there will be 7.5 billion of us on this planet in the middle of the 21st century. Okay, this being so, they ask, what then is the minimum amount of land per person we would need to devote to agriculture to support a population that size. And the figure they come up with, 2,800 square foot per person. Doable. I should say, however, that their statistics are based on a strictly vegan diet, bio-intensive farming, and the composting of all plant and human waste, including post-mortem humans. A somewhat skanky concept at first, I'll grant you. But I think in time it could develop its own dignity and gravitas, especially if the rich and famous lead the way. A year from now, you go into the Vatican Garden and there's one of the cardinals standing next to a huge cylindrical composting drum saying, well, it's a year now since Pope John Paul II sadly passed away. So let's give him a turn. Oh, look at that, he's mulched up lovely for a tough, leathery old bird. Let's spread this rich biomass over the cabbages and beetroot so beloved in his native homeland. Ooh, Glasgow Rangers tattoo. He kept that quiet. <laughs> and I ain't talking about something that may happen at some point in the future one day. Almost every country that ever produced oil has already had the big rollover, already past its peak of domestic oil production. Colombia, 2004. Britain, 2002. Venezuela, 2000, Trinidad and Tobago, 1977, Iran, 76, and the USA, 1970. Three years later, the House Subcommittee on Foreign Relations publishes a report called Oil Fields as Military Objectives, a Feasibility Study, now known as an American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. But I ain't saying the Americans is more evil than anybody else because they ain't. They just got the capability. I have no doubt, for example, that in 1977, Trinidad commissioned its own report called Oil Fields as Military Objectives. Tell us, what is the full strength of our Navy? Would that be including jet skis, sir? <laughs> and of course, catch, 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 22 is the very worst fate that could befall humanity and all the other little species is the discovery of huge new reserves of oil beneath the tundra or the burning into the sky of what's already known about because the climate chaos that would unleash would make the mere collapse of industrial society a sideshow bagatelle therefore since we've got to make the switch from oil anyway why not do it now while we've got an electricity grid that works 24 hours a day to work by while we have cash from the energy windfall of the 70s to invest in renewables and in changing the whole shape of everything. Or we can spend this money sending battleships out to capture the dwindling deposits of the last hours of ancient sunlight. But to make the switch from oil now would take a World War II collective effort on behalf of the citizenry. Would mean for once in our lives getting off our asses and doing something. Us, not politicians, us. Now, when I first started getting involved with radical, direct action, non-hierarchical, eco-autonomous, grassroots organizations, 
I didn't understand the concept of no leaders. I thought I did, but I didn't. And I got to the nearest alpha male or alpha female and say, here's what you should be doing. Why don't you do this? It'd be great if you ordered this. Be, when, when, when are you going to do this? And they give me this look that I never understood, which was kind of... I think, weird. And I got to the next alpha. When are you going to do this? It'd be great if you did this. Why, why, why haven't you done this yet? Yeah, but when are you going to do it? It'd be wonderful. Why, why don't you do this? And again, I get, they give me this look, like... And after a year, the penny dropped, and I finally realised what that look meant, because they won't tell you, because that would be hierarchical, right? So, but I finally realised that what this look meant, what the look meant was, yes, good idea, why don't you do it yourself? You print the leaflets, I'll distribute them. You call a meeting, I'll attend. You organise an action, we'll come along. And from the moment I realised that, my whole philosophical outlook changed. And from then on, instead of suggesting things that other people could do, I stopped suggesting things altogether in case I'd be expected to do them. <laughs> so, just before we all split up into small groups, <laughs> our revels now are ended. So, thank you very much for listening. Thank